Olá a todos, bom dia. É, então, começamos é, o segundo dia do nosso seminário NAVO, do grupo de pesquisa Natureza, Violência e Ecocrítica. É, agradecemos a presença da professora Silvia Federici e dos, do público que está aqui conosco. E, bom, o, o grupo Natureza, Violência e Ecocrítica é, começou, se iniciou em 2020, né? e com, como fruto das discussões realizadas na pós-graduação, e, e o grupo surge como uma forma de resistência àqueles momentos de tanta, tantos desafios para todos nós né? durante a pandemia, em que tivemos de nos defrontar com o isolamento social, né? com diversos temores, como as constantes ameaças de um governo negacionista e antidemocrático, né? que voltou as suas armas contra a universidade pública, né? contexto que a gente se insere. Bom, as discussões do grupo prosseguiram, né? e o grupo continua ativo, no ano passado a gente teve o primeiro seminário NAVE, e, e bom, continuamos o, as nossas atividades hoje, é, o Grupo Nave, né, não falei, ele é vinculado à Faculdade de Letras da Universidade Federal de Minas Gerais. Então, apresento a nossa convidada de hoje, professora Silvia Federici. É, bom, Silvia Federici é uma ativista italiana, feminista, historiadora, pesquisadora e professora radicada em Nova York professora emérita da Universidade Hofstra e cofundadora do Feminist International Collective, que nos anos 70 criou o um movimento de salários para o trabalho doméstico. Na década de 80, trabalhou na, Ni na Nigéria, onde fundou o Committee of Academic Freedom in Africa. Faz parte do Midnight Notes Collective e escreveu diversos livros, entre eles citamos Caliban e a Bruxa e o Ponto Zero da Revolução. Então, professora Federici, a palavra é sua. Uh, boa tarde, uh, good evening to everybody, and thank you, Lisa, and thank you to all the people who have invited me to this event. Um momento, um momento, um momento, um momento. Um momento. Forgive me. It's, Forgive it's okay, me. Professor, it's okay. It's uh, all right. uh, I have to do, I've been doing some care work and I'm very sorry for the introduction, for the interruption, and I'm sure everything is going to be okay now. So yeah, I was thanking everybody you know, for the invitation. And, and also I'm very grateful for uh, the topic that I've been asked to talk about because um, we are living in a very dangerous moment. We are living in a moment in which, uh, you know, the possibility of a world war is uh, on the agenda in which the destruction, the ecological destruction of the planet, you know, it's proceeding in very, very catastrophic way. I mean, just the last few weeks, you know, from Europe uh, to <laughs> every part of the world has been, uh, Really, the destruction of entire community, the destruction of entire population. So the question of what can a feminist movement contribute? You know, what can feminism contribute to the creation of a project, of a program that can actually give us some hope 
you know, give us some hope that, uh, you know, we can create a different kind of society. And this is what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to talk about on the basis of very concrete experiences, not just in terms of utopian speculation, but in terms of concrete experiences that over the years have seen women engaging in, and particularly women. One of the themes I want to develop today is the fact that I've developed the conviction that feminism as a movement potentially has the, has the capacity to create a common ground, to create a common ground because feminism has always been concerned with the question, the fundamental essential question of the reproduction of human life, of the reproduction of human life has always been concerned with political project that as the saying goes, put life at the center. And in that way, I want to show that it has the potential to create a terrain on which different kinds of movements come together. Because the issue of reproduction touches every aspect of our life. When we speak of reproduction, we speak not only of domestic work, child raising, sexuality, procreation, but we also speak of agriculture, the production of food, the maintenance of the environment, education, health, and all the knowledges that come with these experiences, with these activities. So in that way, reproduction is the broader terrain, is the broader terrain on which a whole set of movement can actually connect, can actually gather and uh, join forces to contrast these very devastating destructive forces of contemporary capitalism. I'm sorry, I have to, I have to, the, the phone. Uh, I'm sorry. Don't worry, Professor, it's okay. okay. Yes, you know, speaking from the houses is very difficult to block out all the yes. noise. Eh? Yes, don't worry. Yes. So this is the topic that I want, I want to address. And uh, I want to say that, you know, a month ago, about a month ago, a bit, um, a bit more perhaps, you know, the United Nations has released some data uh, which indicate that this year, 2023, for the first time in the history of humanity, the number of people you know, who lived in an urban environment has surpassed the number of people who lived in rural area. The United Nations has presented, and the World Bank, have presented this data with a great sense of optimism as a sign of sure progress because in their view, in their propaganda, in their ideology, I you know urban life offers so many cultural possibilities. Actually, I think that we have to greet this number, we have to greet this news, you know, with, with a great sense of, of, uh, of worry. We, we have to be very, very preoccupied because what these numbers tell us is that in fact, there is a trend that is at work that is increasingly expelling people from their ancestral home. It's a trend that is very typical. It's structural, systemic of the history of capitalism. Capitalism begins with enclosure. In Marx's world, capitalism begins with the separation of the producers from the means of production, 
which is the condition to impose on people condition of work that are exploitative. You cannot exploit people unless you have deprived them of all the means that they have to reproduce themselves. Marx understood this very well. And I think is the most profound and most important expert of Marxism. The fact that you have a capitalist system, you know, who can exploit people because with violence of different types has been able to take away from them, separate them from all the wealth, all the resources that people need for the reproduction of their lives. So this trend is a systemic trend in the history of capitalism, but it has accelerated significantly since the 1980 with the process that we define as globalization. Globalization is actually a process of recolonization that begins you no, know, with the artificial creation of a debt crisis. You know, the artificial creation, artificial because it was engineered by the US Federal Reserve that in 1979 increased the rate of interest on the dollar, which meant that if you borrowed dollar, you had to pay more which meant that all those who had taken loans in dollars, beginning with many, many countries from the so-called third world, who were coming out of colonialism and they were taking loans in order to catch up, in order to develop, all of a sudden they found themselves unable to repay those loans. They had taken the loans at variable interest rates. So they took the loan at interest rate almost zero. Very soon, they couldn't pay back. This was a classical financial maneuver that was the equivalent of a war. It was a war on all those countries who were coming out of colonialism. It was a way to reconstitute the same condition that had prevailed during the colonial period. Why? Well, because in the name of paying back the debt, remember a debt artificially created, country after country had to open up the door to agribusiness, to oil drilling, mining companies, right? Who could come in with very favorable condition, take over huge amount of land, use it for extractivist purposes of different types, right? So, and here, and, and land, the land is privatized, the land is taken over by foreign companies. And this is where we begin to have the exodus people being pushed out from their land, people being expropriated from their land, communal land ownership destroyed, communities destroyed, people being forced to migrate. The massive migration movement of the 1990s into the present, people continues to migrate. The massive migration movement have really been triggered by the programs activated by the debt crisis, the International Monetary Fund, the World Bank, the Structural Adjustment Program, et cetera, et cetera. So what the United Nations celebrates as people urbanizing and enjoying all the amenities of urban life is in reality an horrendous process of expulsion, of depopulation, of uh, expropriation, and expulsion from their land, the original land of millions of people from the African continent, the Middle East, from Latin America, 
Asia, and this huge colossal migratory movement. You know, the thousands of people that now we see trying to enter the United States or risking their life and often dying crossing the Mediterranean. All of these are the product, are the product of this expulsion, as well as the product, you know, of the, the increasing desertification. When we call climate change, we're talking about many, many parts of the world becoming deserts, and they become deserts because of the economic policies implemented by international capitalism, who does not care about the catastrophic results you know, of their fracking, of their drilling, of their deforestation, right? So the situation that we are confronting is a situation that is extremely dangerous. Also because, you know, this double destruction operated by financial means and also operated through the destruction and exploitation of the natural wealth is accompanied always at all times, necessarily, you know, by a state of permanent warfare. And we keep watching new wars now across the world. And when we look at these wars, we see that at the origin of this war, there are very, very clear economic means that uh, the, at, the, at, the, at the center of the war is the takeover of land that are rich in mineral uh, you know, resources, or they are rich from the point of view of agribusiness and so forth. So this is, I think this is the scenario that we are dealing with. And it's a scenario that is extremely destructive and extremely dangerous because the ecological destruction, we have a triple type of destruction, financial, ecological, and military. And they're all interconnected. I think it's very important for movements that are trying to really transform, create a new society, recognize this interconnection of these three trends, which now constitute the main road of capitalist development in the 21st century. So now, what is the alternative? I think the alternative, there is no guarantee, you know? <laughs> I, I, I refuse to, to say, oh yeah, of course, we're going to win. I, I think that, the, I think, I think that uh, we have to say there is an alternative and we have to say for tourism. First of all, you know, as the saying goes, the first defeat is the struggle that we never made. And uh, we cannot say, oh, well, you know, there's nothing more to do. They, you know, there's always new children who are being born and we have a responsibility towards them. And also, because I've come to the conclusion out of my almost 82 years of experience, I mean, I'm now <laughs> 81, that I don't think there is a more important, more satisfying, more creative work than the work of transforming society, of, of creating a, you know, a more just, more just social relation and, uh, and, and transforming ourselves in the process, transforming ourselves. I don't think there's anything better we can do in life, you know? And, and uh, so what is to be done? And here I think that we have to look at what is already, we have to look at the range of possibilities. And uh, what do we see is that across the world, through all these scenarios 
that I have described. It's really women that are taking the lead, not alone, clearly, but it's really women who are taking the loan in every continent. When I, you know, I've been very, I lived in Nigeria for some years, and I'm always very interested over the years to see what happens in Nigeria, what happens in Africa. And there, you know, women have been uh, very much suffering of uh, forced urbanization, losing their land, being forced to go to the cities. But they have not given up the idea of having a piece of land, not given up the idea of having some autonomy and not depending completely on the market for all the food that they and their families consume. So that one phenomenon, which I think actually is global, a uh, very, very clear cut in, in Africa has been the phenomenon of urban farming. This is a broad, broad change that has taken place over the last two, three decades. Now the countryside has moved to the city and, and women have had a major role with it. Women, communities, women and men, community expelled expropriated, pushed out from their fields, from their rural area, forced to go to the cities, begin to take over land, begin to create a different communities and uh, begin to farm. So communal farming, the, the phenomenon of the urban gardens. Now this has been a very, very important issue. Also in Africa, Women engage in all kinds of programs of reforestation. You may remember the famous case of Wangari Matai in, in Kenya, right? That they planted, I think, more, more than a million trees because they realized that actually it's the trees. Trees, the planting of trees is by itself a tremendous contribution to safety against flood, against excessive heat, against desertification, and trees are the provision also of uh, all kinds of resources, sometimes medical, roots, shade, right? So the question, for example, of, of trees is fundamental. Also in Africa, we have seen the case of Nigeria, you know, women periodically occupying in the oil area, occupying the oil platform and, and for stopping the extraction of oil, knowing that the extraction of oil is so destructive, that the extraction of oil you know, is the cause of a tremendous amount of pollution destruction of cropland, land that was used for food and now begins all contaminated by oil. Acid rain, acid rain even contaminates the kind of soil that has not been extracted. So uh, the extraction of oil has implication. They go far beyond the areas, you know, where the extraction takes place because it affects the whole cycle of life. It affects the rain and it affects the cropland. Very, very important. We move also, you know, I remember the case of India, Vandana Shiva has written very beautiful pages on the struggle of women in India, you know, to reclaim the land to prevent trees from being cut, prevent the logging. You know, she has made famous across the world, the famous Chikpo movement. These were the women on the high hills of the Himalaya, you know, who in front of the loggers coming to cut the trees, began all to hug the trees and put their body 
for the defense, you know. And then she wrote about what forest, what forest signified in the life of people before the coming of capitalism. How in a forest you found everything that was useful for the reproduction of life. So when you cut a forest, you don't just cut a forest. You cut and destroy the means of livelihood for hundreds of people and animals. Uh, and of course, like in America. Today, I think wherever you look, including in Brazil, and I want to talk about Brazil, but everywhere in the world, for instance, women are in the forefront of the struggle against fracking. Uh, they are in the struggle against fracking. Fracking is such a destructive you know, initiative. Uh, it's really the, something of uh, many earthquakes have been traced to the spreading of fracking across the world because it really destroyed the, the consistency of the earth so that place in a place after place, you know, the, the land gives in, the land collapses. It is gutted, it is, um, you know, disemboweled. It is disemboweled of the wealth that it holds, you know? So we find that across Latin America, you know, the women are taking the lead, you know, uh, to defend the, and the same phenomenon of the urban garden. Women in the Amazonia, you know, are leading the struggle, you know? And here I want to speak of something that is extremely worrisome and uh, anguishing, um, but is becoming more and more common. We know that because women have been in the forefront of, of the struggle to defend the land, to reclaim land, like the women of the MST, the landless people of Brazil, right? To defend it against mining, to reclaim it, women have also been top in the list, you know, of assassination by paramilitary, by narco trafficker. The story of the Berta Caceres. But what has been growing, and this is something that I think feminist movement have to mobilize. They have to mobilize, really, and very massively is that more and more these uh, religious fundamentalist sect, Pentecostal, evangelical, are now, you know, in complicity with paramilitary and uh, with, at times, people from local institutions, violently attacking and assassinating those in the communities who are defending the land. And I want to mention here the particular case just taken place. On the 18th of September, two spiritual leaders of the Guarani community in Mato Grosso, Sebastiana Gaudo, and, um, uh, oh God, his name is Lufino, I forgotten. I, I can give you the, the, the full name, were burnt alive in their home. They burnt alive for having consistently fought and led their community to protest and resist the expropriation of acres and acres of land, you know, from the area to be devoted to the cultivation of soya. Already, about 20 people have been assassinated and often burnt alive with the direct instigation or indirect complicity of Pentecostal organization in Latin America, you know, uh, that basically working with the companies. So this is an issue that uh, has to be connected. The rehearsal the, the, uh, the new appearance of, uh, oh, and they, they, they were burnt alive, accused 
of being witches, you no, know, accused of being witches. So once again, you know, in the 21st century, as it was in the 16 and 17, we see witch hunts, right? And the whole talk about the devil and devilish practices being mobilized in defense of capitalist development, in defense of expropriation, right? In defense of the imposition of monetary relation and market, capitalist market, and the destruction of the most basic forms of subsistence. The destruction, these just occurred, but it was not the first. There is now a substantial presence of Pentecostal community who are now working in, in complicity with local chiefs, with uh, foreign companies, local institutions to actually expropriate people from their land, to impose commercial crops, to impose monoculture, which are also destroying the environment. So the, the significance of the creation of networks of women and the creation of, of networks of women who are also capable to connect, you know, from the point of view of the struggle of reproduction, to connect with other movements, connect with other ecological movements, connect with movement against militarism, you know, connect with movement who are fighting against the different forms of warfare, connect with movement who are fighting against the, the politics of debt, right? The fact that now everybody's in debt, you no? Know? More and more, this capitalism that is destroying the environment is also reducing you know, the money that people earn working. It's making work more precarious. It's actually increasing and privatizing the cost of services, creating massive forms of impoverishment. So expropriation, impoverishment, you know, coming from different directions, but uh, in a sense, uh, you know, intensifying each other. This is, the, this is the situation that we are confronting. And it seems to me the, the alternative, what stands in the way is exactly all these very broad women's, uh, you know, uh, mobilization and also the, the small invisible Invisible work that women are making every day, invisible work to actually guarantee their families, their communities, right, a safe meal, to guarantee them, you know, a safe life. And here are some words of why, why women are in the lead. Women are in the lead because they are the ones who are responsible for the reproduction of their family. You know, even if men, some men can be helper, nevertheless, women are still the primary, you know, subjects of the reproduction of everyday life. And every time a forest is cut, every time a river is poisoned, you know, every time a mining comes into town, and the air is totally polluted. The work and the anguish of those women escalates to the, to the clouds. Because how can you cook when you have, you cannot rely on the clean water because clean water is now full of mercury for the mining of gold, you no? Know? How can you uh, reproduce your family when the trees, the fields, the milpas, they used to be there are not? And you only have genetically modified corn. So these networks that are being created and these efforts that women are making to reconstitute communal bonding, 
to reclaim the land, to defend the land, to defend the workers, right? To me, are the salt of the earth. To me, are, and not only to me, they are the road to the future. There is no other struggle that is more important. Because the struggle for the land, and when we say land, we say everything. We say waters, we say trees, we say animals. Animals are our companion. The struggle for the land is the fundamental. When they take away the land, when they push the soul, when they push the soul into the seas, we do not control what we eat. We do not control the water that we, that we drink, the air that we breathe. You know, the, the control over the most basic forms of our reproduction it becomes impossible. Unless, of course, we open up the city, take away the stones, and plant our food in the cities. But even that does not mean that we, we can accept, and even worse, celebrate being pushed out of the countryside, of the rural area of the seas, of the seas, and of the rivers. So this is the struggle. The struggle is to reclaim their wealth. And I think, as I said before, the women are in a especially privileged position, and also at the same time, paying a tremendous price. You know? And here, of course, I want to make the connection between the body territory. You know, our compañeras, you know, from uh, uh, Guatemala, the Lorena Cabnal, who has spoken about the body territory. We cannot defend the territory unless we defend our body. So the importance of the struggle, and, and importance means men have to go to the street. Men have to, not only women have to go to the street to fight against violence against women. Men have to go to the street. The body territory, we cannot defend our territory unless we defend our body. The violence against women is a condition for the ecological destruction of our communities. So, and vice versa, the struggle to reclaim the land, to defend it, is also a struggle to defend knowledges. Because once you lose a forest, a whole set of knowledges are also lost. And knowledge is about the medical property of plants, the medical property of leaves, of roots, of fruits. Right? Uh, knowledge is that relate to procreation, to abortion. Women used to be able to make abortion. People used to cure their malaria without taking pills without relying on the pharmaceutical. This, this slogan that we are launching always, take life out of the market, take life out of the market, you know, cannot take place unless we have this other alternative. We can become autonomous from the market and regain control of our life to the extent that we can reclaim the natural wealth, you know, as well, as uh, the results of the production the generation of people have done before us. So it's the land, the knowledges that come, you know, with the relationship to the land, the reconstitution also of the memory of the past, of the collective memory. You know, we lose the land, we lose our memory, we lose our history. The body territory is also the memory territory. The territory has a memory built into it. We lose a, ter a territory. Territory cities are destroyed. Territories are destroyed. No, we forget the, the link, the precious essential link with the generation that have come before us, with the struggle that have become before our struggle is also lost. And so in reconnecting with the land, we reconnect with a lot more than the land itself. And, uh, and of course, here, this is a work that today can only be accomplished in a collective way.
can only be accomplished if we A, create this broad terrain, this broad common ground where different movements can come together. And also if we, in our everyday to day life, overcome the individualism, the isolation, the separation, you know, created with the nuclear family, you know, with the myths of privacy. And we can recreate a certain, you know, uh, a new social fabric, a new social fabric that where, you know, the struggle that we make is also a struggle to create a new society. It's a struggle that is not only uh, expressed as a protest, it's not only a no saying, a saying no, but it's also constructive. It's also a creation of something new. It's an experimentation with new social relations. And I'll say that, you know, this issue of organization, how we organize our struggle is one of the most important issues that we can talk about. You know, first of all, what the struggle should we accomplish? What is the content of the struggle? But also, what are the forms of organizing? Because I think they all too often, I wrote a, a piece that many people have liked called Joyous Militants. Joyous Militants begins with a struggle that not only is oppositional, when a struggle that is also constructive. One where every day, everything we do, we begin to have a taste, a taste of the society that we want to create, where we begin to have, you know, uh, a taste of the kind of relationship we want to create. We are in the process of struggling, we transform ourselves and our relation with other people. And we create deep bonding. We create affective relation. We create something that cannot be easily destroyed. And on the contrary, can allow our struggle to grow. So I'm saying in fact that, you know, the notion of the commons is, is uh, it's, it's a condition for the continuing of our struggle. It's a continuing for making a struggle that is at the same time, the construction of something new, the construction of a new society, the beginning of the construction of a new society. I'll stop here and then I'll see what are the comments. Great, Professor. Thank you very much for, for your conference. Well, uh, thank you for finding the time to be here with us. And your conference was so illuminating in so many ways. And um, your conference was very optimistic. And this is, <laughs> this is so great because we hear all the time how the world is catastrophical and we are living the apocalypse. And we don't find the ways to fight against it. Yeah. And, and it's great to, to hear all of it. Because uh, one of the questions I think that haunts our group, it's what, what can we do? What should we do? Or what do we have to do? <laughs> right? Right. And I think you, um, you have some great answers to that. Yeah, because from the very beginning, I mean, uh, to me, the question of transforming the way on everyday basis, we organize our reproduction. There is a moment from the great confrontation, being in the streets, being in the square, thousands of people. There is a moment connected with that. And there is a moment of, of the great transformation that goes on of beginning to put our lives in common, of beginning to not wanting to be alone confronting the system, connecting with other women, whether it is a school, with the, whether it is uh, uh, on the question of health, whether it is uh, reading a book, reading books that uh, creating a study group, but beginning to come together, beginning to come together, and then beginning to analyze 
What is our life? What is happening today when we get up? What is our relationship with this person and that person? How can we change that? How we can actually begin to work together? What are the places where we encounter the main crisis in our life? Health, this, that. What can we do with other women? With other women can we con connect with? They maybe can help us in what we try to achieve. This is the process of building. This is a process of building, starting from very modest expectation and yet very much persisting, very much persisting, realizing that it takes time, but realizing that if we move in a proper way, if we move in a certain way, even if it takes time, already something good is happening. Already something good is happening. Because when you begin to connect with other women, when you realize that you're not alone, that some of your problems, you can begin to share them. That some of the things you can begin to do them with other people. Then already is a process of change. And from there, you can see new possibilities, right? We have seen a very creative process, for instance, at the time when it's women from Muna Minas in Argentina fall for a strike. And we all knew that it's difficult to have a strike when it comes to reproduction. If you have a child that is sick, but we also learn that the strike is not just the day that you cross your arm. The strike, it's an excuse in a way to make, to contact all kinds of women to think of all kinds of possibilities. The strike is a tool. It's a process. It's not just a day of refusal, right? And I think it, was, it has been very useful. It has really you know, activated our imagination, our creativity, you know, to think what does it mean to strike to say no? How do you say no creatively? How do you say no in a way that actually says yes? to something else, says yes to something else. Hmm? Sorry, kind of problem with the microphone. Well, thank you. Uh, we have some questions here. But, uh, sure. I, okay, good. Um, uh, I'll ask them in Portuguese. Yeah? You have to translate, yes. Ah, então, é, como a, a professora Elisa Morim, a coordenadora do grupo, is it okay to hear the translation? Yeah, okay. So, como você avalia a luta da juventude ao redor do mundo em defesa da terra e contra a destruição ecológica? Okay. We can take another one? Ah, okay. Um, this one is in English, so I'll read it in English. Uh, Deborah Moura said, Silvia, thank you very much. Uh, I've got a question. The alternatives to our lives, either in cities or in uh, depoblacion rural, uh, which struggles would be more power? Just a second. Okay. Which struggles would be more powerful? The urban engagement for changing the situation or the conscient, conscient reappropriation of the small cities or even areas of planting reconnecting with the environment? Mm -hmm. Okay. I can, I can reply. Certainly, I'm very excited by mm -hmm. the struggle of young people. They, mm -hmm. they now are worried. They now see that these adults that these adults, that they have to take some things into their own hands. And so, for example, in uh, Montana, you know, a group of young women and, 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 and young men have sued in Montana, a state in the United States, have sued the local government for uh, actually putting in jeopardy their lives. 
by giving licenses to companies that are destroying the environment. And the one, the core system said, the state cannot do this. These young people are right. It's the first time in the history of the United States. And these are young people who have brought, but yes, I think uh, young people are mobilizing. And I think it's very, very important. They see, and they see the kind of paralysis in which the world of the adults seems to be to have plunged. So it's that's a very encouraging. And uh, but also we have to learn from them. <laughs> we have to learn from them. And I, I wouldn't say both are important, urban and rural, both are important. And in fact, they have to be connected. They have to be connected. For instance, in the United States, one example is a simple example. We have a, an organization called Community Supported Agriculture. Community Supported Agriculture means that urban people give some money to, to farmers, to farmers to plant and to... And then when the crops are ready, the farmers are bringing them periodically into town, right? So you pass all through, you cut out the market. So there's a direct relationship between the consumer and the producer. And, uh, and this is very, very important. It's very, very important. First of all, you know, you actually realize what it is that you're eating which you don't realize you know, when you're buying in the supermarket and uh, you know, I'm in New York, I may buy some apple and they may be coming from Asia. They may be coming from Vietnam. It's amazing how much the food is traveling. And when that food is traveling, you don't know how it has been produced, what pesticide has been used, what labor relationship, how exploited were the people who produced it. Also, as, as uh, the late uh, uh, feminist Maria Mies, who unfortunately died in May, you know, she always pointed out that the increasing capitalist separation of production and consumption so the production and consumption are more and more distant. You know, what is produced is consumed many times across the ocean. The debt creates, first of all, impossibility to know what is that you are actually doing when you eat something or when you put a dress on your body. You don't know all the blood that has been spilled for that. But secondly, the whole cycle, for example, waste is produced. And then we don't know what to do with the waste. Because in the countryside, when you produce and consume, there's no waste, right? What remains goes back into the earth. Waste is produced by the urban separation, right, of the consumption from the production. And so then we have the problem of the waste and then the waste is burned and then the waste becomes a cancer and then the waste becomes contaminated water, you know? So we need to reconnect production and consumption. And this is where urban and rural have to come together. And we have to connect the struggle of urban movement together with the struggle of rural movement. Those two have to come together. Great, thanks. I think we have um, two more questions. Is it sure. okay? Sure, okay. two more questions. Great. Uh, but first, uh, Elisa, the, the coordinator of our group, has asked me to tell you that our group is, is immensely grateful for you okay. being here. And you're also a uh, um, huge inspiration for us. 
Thank you. Thank you, thank you. I'm very happy that this is the case. Um, so the, the other question is uh, from Isabella. Uh, she said, uh, hello, Professor Federici. Thank you for your lecture. I'm currently studying in Shanghai and we discuss a lot here of the concept of beautiful China and how this country wants to maintain and export this ecological ethos. Nevertheless, it has been said that the government wants to transform the ecological reparation into money. We usually focus on grassroots movements, but what is the role of a state in this radical transformation towards a better relationship with nature? Ah, uh, well, we would love to believe the states have, uh, you know, committed to a proper transformation, that uh, the states are committed to politics that are defending the natural world and are actually helping to restore because nature is wounded. Nature, in fact, is revolting. All these earthquakes, all these floods is because nature is revolting because it has been so, war has been waged against it. In the same way as war is against, waged against many communities. And by the way, we could have a whole chapter talking about what war is doing to the environment. Now the United States is going to send cluster bombs to Ukraine. Cluster bomb will destroy human beings, children, the cropland for decades, decades to come. When they explode, they release many bombs. So war is one of the major causes of destruction and pollution. So uh, the states, we would like to believe that the states are committed. Unfortunately, what we see so far is that the states are committed to companies, to capitalist accumulation. Uh, we don't have actually example of states who are indifferent to the, the question of the accumulation. And, 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 uh, and that's why they are so militarized. That's why states are accumulating weaponry, armies, and uh, I place my trust, my hope, and energy in building movements from below, not from above. Great. Okay, so the last one, uh, it's in Portuguese. Sure. I, yeah, I think you... You glanced over it, but okay. Uh, so, uh, Joyce Jimenez Romero pergunta, é, Bom dia, querida companheira Silvia, como expandir a conscientização e, por conseguinte, ampliar o engajamento para essa luta nas comunidades brasileiras que, se por um lado sofrem as consequências das ações nefastas dessas máquinas de morte, por outro, são dependentes financeiramente dessa mesma indústria que impõe a hegemonia econômica nos espaços que paulatinamente devastam. Right. So, the, yeah, the question again, as I was, uh, you know, indicating before, the question comes from uh, the construction of broad movement, for instance, there is a war that is being waged as the killing of Sebastiana Gaudo, the burning alive of spiritual leader, for example, of the Guarani community in Mato Grosso. These last two were not the first. I think that we need people to mobilize in Brazil against that this is happening, against this sect. People have to learn to come forward, something very horrendous is happening. These people have, the people are defending their lands against the soya, against the, the takeover of land to raise cattle. They themselves have to be protected. They themselves have to be defended. They cannot be left alone. So, 
we are talking about really an understanding, building, building network, building network that can circulate and congregate knowledges and resistance, where what is happening can circulate rapidly, where people can learn what is happening rapidly in their community and where they can begin to join forces. This, I think, is the task. The, unless we do that, then you will always be able to have the person who has assassinated, the struggle that is destroyed because he denied somebody. So we have to create together with system of mobilization, system of defense, system of defense. You know, clearly this struggle, even if you want to use peaceful means, you still have to be able to create system of alarm, system of defense, and the tightening of communal relation. There is the, the, most, the most important avenue to do that. Great. Well, uh, thank you very much, Professor. Uh, com, como um último comentário, é, bom, aqui no Brasil, né, é, nós estamos sofrendo algumas pressões para explorar a, a, a Amazônia, né, e para explorar, é, desculpa aqui, o petróleo na Amazônia. E eu acho que, que a senhora já, já falou sobre isso durante a sua fala, até sobre as mulheres é. que seguiam até as plataformas de óleo para protestar, para impedir que isso continuasse. Né? Então, acho que a sua fala ditou bastante o tom a é. respeito né? nesse sentido, mas acho importante a gente destacar na, na nossa fala esse grande problema né, muito grave que a gente tem que ficar de olho na, na política brasileira. Né? Bem, é, a senhora gostaria de falar mais alguma coisa? Well, yes, I say that this, this is a, there is a process of uh, fascistization, cultural, political, economic fascistization that is moving across the world. The moment is very dangerous. We have the prospects ahead for the global um, of a new world war. And I think that that fight is so crucial for all of us to be able to engage ourselves, not, not to give in to pessimism, but to be able to engage ourselves according to our possibilities but not to continue to confront and despair, but to actually begin to connect with other people and see what are the things that we can do to transform our community immediately. And, and with that, because you know, really the global is in the local. It's very difficult to change something that does not have a low, a also a global impact and vice versa. So I think that what we see, what you experiment in Brazil is a phenomenon that is international. I am in Italy now. I was in Greece before. We, we came to visit families. Uh, and uh, we hear the same and the same and the same. Uh, the fascist government in Greece, the police attacking the social center, the social spaces a whole struggle to defend, you know, what people had already built in the past years. And many of those spaces were being closed. Italy, the same as you probably heard, you know, we have a prime minister who is a disgrace, she's a woman, head of a party called Brothers of Italy, Brothers of Italy. She forgot they're also sisters. And, uh, You know, she goes to Bucharest where they used, there was a conference on demographic planning, gave a big speech, pro-life, pro-life and pro-life. The same pro-life government are funding military, are funding wars, the hypocrisy. 
So we need to, to unmask this hypocrisy. We need to unmask the hypocrisy of religious organizations who are accomplices of the oil companies, who are accomplices of the companies of the soil. And we need to join our forces so that we are not assassinated, burnt alive, persecuted. I think that all this, it's huge and task, but there's a lot of people who have a direct interest, who really, whose life do not have an alternative. And I trust to the fact that uh, this must, is an incentive. There's really, we have to say there is no alternative. We have to say there is no alternative. Yeah. But to come together and, and to make a struggle and to change the logic of this system because we live in a system that is driven by a very destructive logic. And we understood it. The feminist movement understood it very intensely in the 70s when we saw that the work that women do, they have done domestic work, procreation, child, was completely devalued, was not even considered real work. And we realize that this is a society that devalues our life. This is a society that is driven by a logic of exploitation through devaluation, super exploitation through devaluation. And that's why it has to change. Amazing, thank you very much. Thank so... you, thanks to you. <laughs> um... Bom, só lembrando, a nossa programação continua hoje, né? Às nove e meia, é, Rita de Cássia Mesquipa, secretária nacional de biodiversidade, vai estar aqui conosco. À tarde, às duas horas, a professora Fabrícia Wallace, da UNB, e o professor Eduardo Góes Neves, da USP. E para encerrar o, o, a, o nosso seminário, teremos o escritor Márcio Souza. Uh, thank you very much, Silvia, and uh, that's it. <laughs> thank you very much to all of you. you know, in November, I will be in Brazil. Oh, really? I'm coming to Brazil in November. I'm going to Sao Paulo and to a festival of Parati. Oh, Parati. really? Yes. Oh, yeah, great. That's there. amazing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, so we'll the see you here. Yes. All the best to you too. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> bye bye. Bye.